Yeah, we continue our series in the book of uh, Daniel, and if you have not been part of the uh, series so far, maybe some of you can very much relate to Daniel. He was probably a young boy in Judah who had very different plans about his life. <laughs> and then because of external circumstances, his life took a drastic turn in a different direction. He became one of these exiles in Babylon, the dominant empire at that time. And he was trained in the service of the king. He became one of the eunuchs in the king's service. And he was a high-ranking official then for many years in this Babylonian empire. So we are today in chapter 5, and he is much older now, Daniel, probably around 80 years old. He has had a long career in the service of this king. But if we study this chapter, Daniel 5, this time in the history of this empire, we get the impression that Daniel now is in the kingdom that is marked by decay and decadence. Nebuchadnezzar, we had heard about last time, he was a, was a national figure of the past who had lived about 20 years earlier. And at this time in chapter 5, it seems that entertainment and pleasure have replaced former ambition and a strive for also readiness in the face of national threats. The narrator here, who is the Holy Spirit, as we know, the Holy Spirit has inspired people to write these books in the Bible. The Holy Spirit gives us a divine perspective on the development at this stage in the history of Babylon, this empire. And what we will see, we'll see that God is in sovereign control again over the events on that special day in chapter 5 of the book of Daniel. God is able to even use gross blasphemy and rebellion to move his plan forward. We are here very close to the fulfillment of Isaiah. Isaiah, more than 150 years before that chapter 5 event, he had prophesied about a guy named Cyrus. And in Isaiah 44, 28, we read uh, the prophecy of Isaiah, this old prophecy. God says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he shall fulfill all my purpose, saying of Jerusalem, he shall be built, and of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. That was prophesied long before the temple was destroyed, but now, actually, we are very, very close to the fulfillment of this prophecy in Daniel 5, because the Persians and the Medes were actually maybe even besieging uh, Babylon at this point, and they will take over this empire, and there will be a decree from Cyrus to release the Jews and to rebuild Jerusalem. But I would say today's chapter 5 is one of the most serious texts in the Bible I ever had to preach on. I would say if the following uh, verse in this chapter doesn't give you chills, you are probably too desensitized. <laughs> It's this verse 27, uh, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, which basically means you are not sufficient. It is final. You <laughs> are a person beyond hope. Maybe, maybe once you went through a job interview, you applied for a job, you went through a three-day assessment center, and at the end of the process, you hear, I'm sorry, but you don't match our criteria for that position. You wouldn't be able to live up to the expectation for that job. Or imagine you have been dating a person, a young man, a woman for a longer time, you invested much time and money, <laughs> In the process, you had hopes uh, uh, of a bright future, maybe. <laughs> but then you meet for dinner and you hear, I'm sorry, but you don't met. I'm uh, sorry, but, <laughs> uh, um, but this relationship just doesn't really work. <laughs> Let's just break up now uh, and not waste more time with this. Um, and there were probably warning signs all along the way. <laughs> But maybe we were just uh, not really paying attention to these warning signs. 
we weren't really willing to face the consequences maybe of reality and to adjust our course. And there's a point in our life we learn here in chapter five very forcefully when uh, with God, when he will not be mocked by us any longer. God is on the throne and we are not on the throne. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, thank you for the sobering chapter five here in this book of Daniel. I was really struck by the seriousness of the message of this book. Lord, it reminds us again of who you are and of who we are. How easily we slip into an attitude of pride and complacency, arrogance. Lord, and how we miss all these loving warning signs from you, our creator. Well, we ask that you would uh, reach our heart today, touch, touch our hearts, our minds. Lord, lead us to repentance where it's necessary. But we thank you for your plan of salvation, that you are not far away. Lord, that we can uh, access your grace through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We pray in his name. We pray that you would illuminate our, our minds to understand this. Amen. Yeah, in the first uh, part of the book, we, we learn that just that uh, human pride and arrogance is taken to a completely new level here. We heard about, Jordi was preaching about Nebuchadnezzar, how he was looking down on his city, his accomplishments with pride. This is what I have built in my own strength. But here, one of his, his um, followers would actually take this arrogance to, to a new level. In Daniel 5, we read then that King Belshazzar made a great feast and he was gathering all the influential leaders in his empire for this feast and they drank wine. It was a thousand people gathered, maybe for propaganda purposes at a crucial moment in the, at the in the time of this empire. And then we read Belshazzar when he tasted the wine commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. And they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. And then this really... Yeah, forceful statement. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Let's just uh, talk a little bit about Belshazzar, a new figure in this book here. We haven't met him yet. Actually, one argument to put this whole book of Daniel in the category of fairy tales was the fact that um, there was not a bit of information about a king called Belshazzar. <laughs> Extra biblical accounts of the lineage of these uh, neo-Babylonian kings made no mention of a Belshazzar. <laughs> so apart from the biblical account, he was totally unknown until texts were recovered from 1854 onwards, naming him as son of uh, Nabonidus, the last king of Babylon. And now with much more archeological data, we actually know that, that this Belshazzar uh, exercised royal authority during his father's 10 year absence in Arabia. <laughs> and he was worsh a worshiper of the sun, his father Nabonidus, which also maybe caused much religious tension in Babylon at this time. So Belshazzar functioned as a co-regent and is also named beside his father in oath formula. And that's why here in Daniel he is refer referenced as king. He was very likely not a son of Nebuchadnezzar, although Nebuchadnezzar is mentioned here as his father, but in the sense probably more of a predecessor. Nebuchadnezzar was a predecessor as king in Babylon. So I mentioned this, maybe this huge banquet with 1,000 leading people in this uh, kingdom had 
some propaganda purposes. Maybe it was a critical time in the, in the history of the empire. Some people think maybe the city was already under siege by the Persians and the Medes. It was an immediate threat, but they just trusted in their defense system. But he takes it to another level here, uh, Belshazzar, he, as he gathers these leaders, and they are surrounded by idols of the society that they worship. He just spontaneously maybe, or if it's part of his propaganda, he orders to bring in these sacred, these holy vessels from the Jerusalem temple. It had been stored somewhere, and he wants them to drink out of these vessels that were meant to be used in the service of Yahweh, the God of the Israelites. So it was kind of a humiliating uh, act towards all those who uh, worshipped Yahweh. And he also profaned these sacred vessels by, the, by this common use of just drinking their wine out of them. So these vessels were meant as holy vessels in the service of Yahweh. And this was a deliberate insult of the God of the Jews, which Belshazzar would, should have known it is the God of the universe, the God of all gods, the God of heaven, who can bring kings down and can, can lift up those kings. So he had profaned the vessels here in this partying uh, and it was a deliberate insult against the God of the Jews. But he takes it a step further even, like by using these, these goblets, these temple vessels, um, vessels to toast to his man-made idols. Now, imagine they drink, they are partying, they're getting drunk, and then they worship, they toast to these man-made gods. He insults Almighty God by honoring these man-made idols. It's a foolish paradox, someone said, of man worshiping their own creation. We feel more happy, more satisfied to worship these things that we have made ourselves in our own strength and to worship the creator who has made us in his eternal almighty strength. What a hubris here of Belshazzar to, to uh, yeah, create this offense to Almighty God. Maybe there was a sense of in, to being invincible as, uh, uh, as they are gathered behind their walls here in Babylon. So to summarize it, Belshazzar is dragging the sacred into the realm of the profane and he's by the, doing this perverting these sacred things in the service of the Lord. The vessels, he could say, were a symbol of the presence of God, and they were just hidden, some were stored in a kingly depot, but now he's desecrating them even more by using them in this, um, in this party. Maybe it's a deliberate propaganda act also in showing <laughs> that the gods of Babylon are stronger than the gods of their enemies. And by using these vessels, he wanted to show as Nebuchadnezzar was able in the power of our gods to conquer Yahweh and his people. So also today, under the threat of these Persians and Medes, with our gods, powerful gods, we are able to, to, uh, to gain the victory and to, to defeat them. So there might be a big propaganda purpose behind it, but what a delusion, <laughs> partying while the, the, the nation is under threat. I was reminded of Hitler and the Nazis in the last month, weeks of the Second World War. <laughs> I mean, they were still hoping that by some miraculous event, things would change. What had happened to Frederick the Great in Prussia, he was pushed against the wall with tons of enemies and because of a death of Catherine the Great, suddenly things turn around. And Hitler and his guys, they were under this delusion <laughs> with the Russians and Americans that at some point something will happen, some divine uh, purpose will unfold and things will turn around. What a delusion. It seems to me they're under similar delusion here, <laughs> not recognizing the threat that they're under. They trust in their man-made idols that they have. 
but something very unexpected, uh, dramatic is happening here. They actually all have an encounter with the transcendent God or the divine that overwhelms them because immediately the text says in verse five, fingers of a human hand appeared and rolled on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite to the lampstand. And everybody in this throne room was able to see these fingers writing something on the wall. It was a disembodied hand, obviously a sign of something supernatural, something not of this earth, something that transcends our human understanding. And it says in the text, the king's limbs lost their stability and his knees knocked together out of shock and fear. He's just shaking. And he's probably not the only one who's shaking because that transcends our understanding of how, how things are supposed to be. And probably the king also sees this, these fingers as something that points to something disastrous in his life. And the walls of the throne room have been excavated by German archaeologists in 1899, and we learned that the throne room actually was uh, really coated with white gypsum. <laughs> so the writing on the wall could really be seen by anyone, especially in the light of this lampstand. Everybody could see the fingers, could uh, see the writing, but no one was able to read it uh, or interpret it. Let's just stop there for a moment. I think just um, encountering, experiencing something supernatural that just shakes us and our world through and through. And probably you have those moments when you realize there's something happening that is not normal. It is not of this earth. There's a voice, there's something changing in the atmosphere in my life, and I should pay attention. These things shake us in our world. Don't waste those moments when the Lord interrupts you in your path and makes you think. God is using this for your good. Sometimes God confronts us in a dramatic way with a picture of reality that we haven't been able to or willing to see yet. And these moments should make us stop. They should make us humble. They should help us to acknowledge God's sovereign control over our lives and to realize how weak and finite we are. And we have these earth-shaking moments, <laughs> maybe after a loss, after we go through challenging situations. But I would say our human tendency is to quickly restore our sense of self-sufficiency. We naturally, just see it in myself, we naturally drift towards those things that feed our ego, our sense of pride, our sense of self-sufficiency. So the New Testament reminds us even today as we listen to these words, today if you hear his voice, <laughs> If you hear a voice that is different than any other voice, if you hear that voice today through God's word, then do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion it says. Things unfold further. Nobody has a clue what to do. The, all the wise men of Babylon have no clue what the writing is saying. So, But there's one person outside of the throne room, the banquet hall, and she probably realized the tumult that is going on, the noise. People are upset. It's the, probably the, called here the queen, but probably the queen mother, the mother of uh, Belshazzar, maybe a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, we don't know. But she hears the, the turmoil. She gets into the room, and then she, and with kind of dignity and authority as the queen mother here, she points to a solution. There's someone who would be able to read and interpret this supernatural writing on the wall. So she remembered Daniel, the, the, who was once the head of the wise men. It seems that he'd lost this position. He was about 80 years old, but he was still in the service of the king. So she, she advises the king to, to ask to bring Daniel into interpret this writing. And it's the third time here in the book of Daniel that they bring in Daniel uh, to, uh, to explain certain things, dreams and visions. And it's the third time that Daniel shows his superiority over all the wise men in this 
kingdom of Babylon. So Daniel is brought before the king. And it's interesting how the king here uh, actually starts talking to Daniel. Daniel, remember, belongs to these people that have been mocked, or their God has just been mocked by the use of the vessels, Yahweh. Daniel is one of these Israelites, and their God just had been mocked in the most horrible way. And this is how the king, Belshazzar, starts his conversation with Daniel. And Calvin pointed out here that the king, it sounds like, interrogates Daniel as if he were a prisoner. Like, you are that Daniel, also using his Jewish name, you are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. Could be honoring, but it sounds also like he's, in, he's, he's treating him like a, like a slave, <laughs> like one a person of these people that were conquered and brought into exile to serve the Babylonian Empire. And then Belshazzar begins his words twice with, I have heard. <laughs> He's not saying, you are that person, but I have heard. Maybe it's true, maybe not. It sounds like more skepticism. Apparently, the king's expectation concerning Daniel's ability to interpret the writing is not very high. But in the following discourse between Daniel and the king, it's just fascinating to see the contrast how Daniel was dealing with Nebuchadnezzar and how Daniel is speaking with Belshazzar here. When we read about Nebuchadnezzar, it seems that Daniel always had some kind of almost sympathy for this guy. <laughs> he didn't uh, rejoice in his downfall. He wanted to help him by revealing truth to him. He showed respect to Nebuchadnezzar, even concern. But here Daniel, it seems, is rather annoyed and maybe could call it short-tempered, lacking the kind of gentleness that he had in his former relationship. There is really an emotional distance here between Belshazzar and Daniel. Because this king and his kingdom are doomed, and Daniel knows it. We come to our last point here, not learning from lessons of the past leads to downfall. And that's the meat of this, um, this chapter here. And Daniel reminds the king of the story of Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> how he became so arrogant, so full of pride that God had to humiliate him. He was living like an animal <laughs> outside in the rain, eating grass until he realized that there's someone higher, there's someone more powerful than he is, that he has to submit to the Lord of the whole earth, the Lord of heaven, the God, the most high God, who rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And Daniel reminds him that Nebuchadnezzar's heart had been hardened and that his spirit was hardened and that he dealt proudly as king and then God had to humiliate him and bring him down on his knees. And then in verse 22, it's so important, and you, Daniel, approaches <laughs> Belshazzar, you have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of this house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver and gold and so on, who do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, your very life, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Then from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, yet it's prepares the ground. <laughs> I guess Belshazzar gets the sense, oh, this will not end well here because <laughs> I really have offended this, the God of the whole earth. And I have not paid attention to the lesson that I should have learned from my predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. And often in the Old Testament, the prophets of God, they were functioning like the conscience of the king. And so also here, uh, Daniel has to remind this powerful king 
that he is not the supreme power, but that God most high, almighty God, the true God, is the supreme power over all kings and all other so-called gods. Then Daniel makes it clear like he, the king promises him honor and rewards and Daniel says, no, I don't, I don't want this. And it sounds like an insult, but I think Daniel wants to make clear, whatever I'm going to say to you now, it's not influenced by my reward. I will brutally, ruthlessly speak to you the truth that I know as I read this writing. So he rejects any reward from, from Belshazzar at this point, He's refusing us to remain his integrity before the king as he speaks the truth to him. And uh, we learn here an important principle in this verse 2022, an important biblical principle in all of the Bible. Uh, it makes a difference if we knew something about the Lord's will, or if we could have known the will of the Lord, or if we simply had no chance to know and to learn the will of the Lord. Now he says, you, you knew all this. You knew this about you, Nebuchadnezzar. You knew something about the God of the Jews. But though you, though you knew it, <laughs> nevertheless, you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, against Almighty God. <laughs> what an offense. He knew so much. He was not willing to repent, not willing to learn the lessons from the past. And that's something that relates even to us Christians, this principle we will face consequences depending on how much we have known the will of the Lord. We just had it in our house group a while ago, Luke 12. Jesus talks about this parable of the servants in the master's house. Jesus is the master. We are all his servants in his service. And Jesus tells you and me here as we are serving him that he says, um, and that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved the beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. It's a dangerous path. No? <laughs> the more you know about the Lord's will through his word, the more you also are accountable to live out that will that the Lord has for us. And here we are servants of the Lord. May we treat him as our master, and may we be quick to respond to his commands. And I know that I'm guilty of this, that I'm too slow often to follow his commands. Yeah, now Daniel explains the meaning of this writing here. And the writing says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parsin. And uh, it says, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. You have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. It says, then Belshazzar gave the command. Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and the proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And then it says, the very night Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Yeah, this is one of the most frightening verses in the Bible. <laughs> you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. You have been really examined carefully, but you have to be rejected now, ultimately. Belshazzar, Belshazzar and the Babylonian Empire, they have not measured up. They will be replaced by the Persians. There was no time revealed here, but we see that Belshazzar was probably unaware that he would die uh, the same night even, before he would see dawn. So when the hand, his fingers begin writing on the wall, Belshazzar's fate is sealed. 
there will be swift and uh, sure judgment. The writing on the wall, you could say, confronts him with God's death sentence. And Daniel delivers this unconditional message of judgment that excludes an alternative ending. There was no more room for repentance. Wow, that's scary. If you reach a point where there's no more room for repentance, because God is not to be mocked. Belshazzar knew what he was supposed to do. He had knowledge of all the lessons that were necessary to, to follow, to learn from, but he, he failed to do so. He had hardened his heart in his stubbornness and his rebellion against the Most High God, and he was responsible for his actions. So God shows what he does with one who remains unrepentant. He reveals who in the end is more powerful I was reminded of the person Saul, also someone, a, a story about Saul that is so sobering, frightening as, one, as someone who is in the service of the Lord. There's this point when, when Saul just completely not obeys God's command in one point. And then God rejects him as the king of Israel. God has ch had chosen Saul out of all of the men of Israel to be the king. But then at this point, because of disobedience, God rejects Saul ultimately. And it's found here in 1 Samuel 15, 22, 28. Because he didn't obey God, God says, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And then it says at the end, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given to an, it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. What a sobering warning, especially to people in spiritual leadership. We are entrusted with a certain authority, a place in the service of the Lord. But may we not enter the state of hardening our heart of disobedience because there's probably someone who's better than us <laughs> that the Lord will entrust with this task. And then finally, yeah, Daniel accepts this reward that he first refused to receive, maybe also a, as a sign to honor the God to reveal this truth to the king. Yeah, let's end with application here. I would say the main lesson is God is not mocked. Yeah, God will not be mocked in the, in the end. <laughs> it doesn't matter how long it takes, but he will not be mocked by us. If you are maybe someone who doesn't know the Lord yet, if you would consider yourself to be not to be a Christian, maybe a skeptic, an agnostic, a, 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 someone who seeks, but maybe you think that your defenses are strong enough, even strong enough to face the last enemy that we have, death. You're like these Babylonians behind their defensive fortifications, even partying while the enemy is approaching the city. You think in the, in the long run, in the end, it will all be fine. My defense system will hold but you neglect the fact, that's the word of the Bible, you neglect the fact that one day you will have to give an account to the one who created you. The one you owe life and everything else, you owe it to him, the one who created you, who placed you on this earth. The one who will be your judge, God. God is the sovereign ruler of the universe that you have been spitting in the face your entire life. Do you think that you are more powerful than God? Yeah, Persian forces, uh, forces eventually captured Babylon, maybe this following day even. <laughs> How did they do it? We know it from the Greek historian uh, Herodotus. By diverting the Euphrates River, they caused actually ground to walk right through the defensive fortifications. <laughs> they were, and they even said, the historian says, they were partying inside. <laughs> They di diverted the river and they just got right into the city. They felt safe behind their thick walls and towers. And God made it possible that the enemy was just walking right into the city and capturing it. 
Is your defensive fortification strong enough to face death, to face your creator one day? God is not mocked. But it's not too late. That's the good news today. <laughs> Today's message uh, is a loving warning, actually, to every one of us. That it's not too late. Repent. Turn. <laughs> Walk in a different direction from now on and look to the Lord and follow his will as it is revealed in Scripture. Come to the cross where Jesus laid down his life for you and for me to pay the price for our sin so that we can have hope. Second Peter says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. It's like with these Babylonians, it came like a thief. Wow, they were in the city over, <laughs> game over. That's how the day of the Lord will be when they say it's peace, everything is fine, then the, the Lord will come. If you are a person, you would say, I'm a person of the church. I've been born into the church, I belong to the church, I'm a part of the church. And you consider yourself on the right side of history, so to speak. <laughs> what is your attitude toward God whom you are worshiping? Has pride and complacency maybe crept in over time? Are you more concerned with your own prestige and success than with the glory of God and his will? Do you consider yourself rich and self-sufficient? Do you think you can just run in your own strength <laughs> through life and serve the Lord? <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I see church services and you get the impression these people are just celebrating themselves. <laughs> what a great building, what a great music. I know how many people are gathered here. We are celebrating more ourselves than we are actually worshiping the Lord and bringing glory to the Lord. And as I must say, I see that in my own life. <laughs> God is not mocked in the end. We will reap what we have sown. We have sown on, this, on the flesh or we have sown on the spirit. I find myself like checking the attendance on Sunday by myself checking the views of our YouTube live streams. <laughs> How is it like going up the number during the week? <laughs> How many people have looked my name up on LinkedIn? How many people maybe have recently asked me for counsel or for help in some areas? And it's all the sense of feeding my pride, <laughs> gaining a sense of self-value, becoming complacent, I deserve this. The Lord is blessing me. I must be on the right path, like, almost like Nebuchadnezzar looking down, this is what I have created in my own strength. But in the book of Daniel here, we see that the misuse of these sacred objects associated with the worship of God, things that belong to the realm of the sacred, <laughs> they have been misused for human purposes, arrogance, pride. And am I doing the same maybe in the service of the Lord that I'm just using those things for my own glory, my own fame? Do I fail this command to really not use the Lord's name in vain, to drag the sacred things into the realm of the profane of my own fame and success in life? The risen Christ in Revelation to the church in Sardis, he says, remember then what you received and heard, Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. What a serious word of warning here to a church in Sardis. Repent. If not, I will come against you. Christ is still standing at the door. We read Revelation is knocking at the door. He's not talking about unbelievers, he's talking about these churches, he's talking about people who gather as Christians in local churches. And he says, I'm standing here at the door knocking, guys, and I know your condition. I can see, see through all the outward worship, and I see all the pride, and I see all the self-sufficiency, the complacency, the self-worship, and I, I command you to repent, but I'm still standing here and knocking at the door. And whoever will open the door, I will come in and have fellowship with him. What habits can you build into your life that maybe help you to remain humble before God? 
I think it's a very important question. We all need some disciplines, some habits built into our daily life that keep us humble, that helps us to maintain the correct perspective on ourselves. I would say it all starts with the gospel. Keep gospel focused. <laughs> Never lose sight of the fact that we all have been sinners, totally lost, helplessly stuck in our sin or rebellion. And because of God's great mercy, because of God's grace, love only, we now have hope in Jesus Christ in his sacrifice for us. Hold on to the love of Christ. Meditate on it. The love of Christ that he is the one who died for sinners like you and me. Hold on to that love and it will make you humble <laughs> because you realize the, the immense dimension of the sacrifice necessary to reconcile us. Confession. Confess your sins to God on a regular basis, but even go beyond that. Confess your sins to a brother, a sister. That's so hard. <laughs> so hard, but it's one of the best disciplines in your life to, to remain humble, to confess actually how rotten you still are. <laughs> How still you depend, how much you depend on God's forgiveness and God's grace. What a great discipline to confess our sins to one another. Also, if you serve in the context of the church, serve also in ways that are unnoticed. Nobody will know about this except God who sees those things that are hidden. It's a great way to remain humble, to serve in ways that nobody knows about. Yeah, maybe you can find other habits that you can build into your daily routines to remain humble before a holy God. And finally, maybe the question is always, where do we find Jesus? Where do we find the good news in the Old Testament even? It was a very severe, serious passage here. Where is the good news? And I would say it's we are so close to the Jews returning to, from exile to their homeland. At the time was fulfilled for the end of the exile after 70 years. And you could say as Daniel is like honored with his new clothes and the golden chain around his neck, it's foreshadowing actually the great acceptance of God, of his people and the return of the exiles back to their home country and the rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple. There's some great comfort in the fact that God knows these times. He has uh, appointed certain times to test us, to make us go through trials. But we also have this comfort that the, these trials will end in God's timing, and he has the power to carry us through these trials. And we will gain the eternal reward as those who have been faithful, those who have been humble before a holy God, who have learned their lessons, <laughs> and who have given God the honor that he deserves. Let's pray, and the worship team can already come up for our closing song. Lord, we thank you for this chapter that was so hard, that is so far removed historically, time-wise, but we find ourselves in the same temptation to want honor for ourselves, to, to become complacent, to, to think we, we, all of this is for our own glory, for our own fame. Lord, that we even draw, drag this, the sacred into the realm of the profane. Lord, we ask that you would convict, continue to convict us in our hearts about these things where we just pretend to be God lovers, but actually only love ourselves and work for our own purposes and our own goals. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. That we can always repent that you are standing there knocking, Lord. Help us to open our hearts to welcome you to be obedient servants to the Master. Amen.